Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and I am joined today by my brother, the Gritty Broman, behind the camera. How are you, Brent? I'm well. Thank you. Right on. So today's podcast is another episode with Mark Livesey. We're talking about e-scouting, uh, scouting from home, and the and this this next module that he covers is elk hunting realities and limitations. It's a kind of a philosophical discussion about you know why you need to evaluate that and what's important. Mm-hmm. And he's kind of like Mark is kind of like you know as much as it's important to evaluate your elk hunting realities. You also need to evaluate your group's hunt elk uh-huh. hunting realities. And I, you know, a lot of this is somewhat intuitive, but sometimes it's not. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, your fitness, your health, your wellness, your mental ability. If you're going solo, I, I got a lot of emails this year from people saying I quit early and I went home and I'm so mad at myself now. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, finding strategies for, for uh, recognizing those realities is an important discussion to have and then ways to combat those realities or to, to head those off is, is really important. So I think you're going to enjoy today's discussion. Again, that's, that's Mark Livesey over at Treeline Academy. Uh, I can't recommend the e-scouting course enough. If you use, use the code gritty, you save, I think it's 99 bucks with the code gritty. It's worth every penny. You should check it out. Um, before we get into the show with Mark, I want to plug a couple of our partners, Mountain Ops. You use the code gritty at Mountain Ops, get yourself some Ignite. Well, what else, Brent, right now? Ignite or Yeti pre workout. I like the Blaze shots, been using those a lot. Slumber. slumber. Yeah, if you're having a little trouble sleeping, check out the Slumber. That's good stuff. They also got the regular, like protein, they got the collagen, the super green, peanut butter bliss, peanut mm-hmm. butter bars. Yeah. There's, there's some, there's plenty out there. Check that out. I also like the Merino, uh, the Merino hoodie, uh, Merino wool hoodie, which mm-hmm. I used all early season. Um, it's nice to have next year skin wool and, uh, they make a nice, nice hoodie, uh, beat the crap out of that. So check that out. And then, uh, use the code gritty at custom for, for some custom orthotics with sheep feet. Um, we get a lot of comments on that or questions about those. Uh, those sheep feet, if you got problems with your feet and I pretty much, I feel like everyone should have a set of these, they're custom orthotics. They, they ship out to you a little mold that you like, uh, mm-hmm. do at home and you get an impression of your foot, send it back and they build orthotics that are custom to your foot and you slip those things in your boots. And I don't care what boots you've got. They take your boots and they just make them 10 times better. And, uh, uh, for years, I run, I ran those super feet, those mm-hmm. green ones you just get at the store. They don't really fit my foot, but they're better than what comes in a boot. But once I switched to to sheep feet, and Ryan had been running the sheep feet for six months before me, and I was like, "What, what, what do you got there?" You know, and uh, he's like, "Oh, sheep just feet." And I'm like, "What? <laughs> Were you holding out on me?" So you got to check that out, uh, sheep feet, and again. Uh, the foot fatigue, the soreness, all that kind of stuff um, went away. I used to get this cramp when I straightened my foot out at night and in my sleeping bag, and my foot would lock like sometimes, especially if I was dehydrated. But once I put in those orthotics, I'm get I don't I'm not having that. The side healing is a lot better with those. So check those out. I, you will like them. And then uh, use the code Gritty at Goat Knives or Gritty Goat rather at Goat Knives. And, uh, that's a pretty sweet little, um, goat knives has come out with two knives that I, that I like. One is a replaceable blade titanium knife for skinning and your typical, mm-hmm. it's kind of like a really long handle. Yeah. And, and, um, it, it's, it, it also has different Allen keys with it so I can adjust my bow I can pack those right into the handle of the knife. So it's a multifunction tool. It's got a uh, cord on it as well. So you, if you got in a jam, you have a little rope there. It, it's got multiple functions. Uh, and for a replaceable blade knife, it's, it's, it's super tiny, lightweight. It's a legit setup. But the other knife that you got to check out, I've been running and using more than my Benchmade Altitude. I think the Benchmade Altitude is like $300 or something. 
it's an expensive knife made out of some excellent steel. And I like the altitude, and it hangs around your neck in a Kydex sheath. Well, Goat Knives came out with a uh, a basically a, a similar setup where you, you have that knife around your neck in a Kydex sheath. And that knife, ha- I don't remember the steel, nitro steel or something, is... It's Are you talking about the Tur T U R? Yeah. Yeah, the Tur Carbon Pro. Nitro V blade steel. Yeah. So Ryan and I have tested it a lot, skinned a bunch of animals with it, beat the crap out of it, and it's a it's an excellent knife, and it's far less expensive than the altitude. And at this point, Ryan is enjoying it a lot more than his altitude. Uh, he told me on the last hunt, he's like, "Man, I it's 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 uh, slightly easier to sharpen, and it seems to hold an edge a little better." And he likes the shape of it more uh, and the feel of it when he's working on the animal. So if you look at our latest videos, you'll see Ryan's running both of those goat knives for everything. Um, and, uh, I've been, I've been testing it against my other knives back and forth and messing around with it and sharpening and, you know, hmm. they're sold out on Are the website. They? Yeah. They only have the capper hunter. Dang it. Well, folks, keep, keep an eye out for those, for those knives. Maybe not mention that. Yeah. I would just point telling you anyway that's they're great knives so check out check that out use the code gritty goat there and <laughs> the only capper hunter ti that they have in stock is the pink one mm. <laughs> yeah. and use the code gritty at peaks equipment over at sissy sticks get yourself some trekking poles uh that's it for today okay any anything else there? Oh, and for some of us, we're flinging some arrows down down range lately. You can use the code Gritty at Valkyrie Archery, and you're going to save on broadheads. Save ten percent, I think, which is a lot because they're expensive, <laughs> but they're they're nice broadheads. They have a lifetime warranty. They're I think the best in the industry. Mm-hmm. They got the center pin technology for those jaggers, but they have a lot of different different setups down there. They even have a new mechanical for those, for those guys, 180 grain mechanical head. <laughs> uh, so, and I've heard good things about it. I'm not particularly a fan, but if I'm hunting coos deer, I don't mind a mechanical because they're like tiny little targets. Uh, I don't need a, uh, to b- bone breaking, mm-hmm. um, you know, center pin jagger for that. Like I do for elk. Um, you just need to give them a large paper cut. Yeah. So, so check out Valkyrie archery. Uh, all right, that's it. Let's get into the show. Welcome to the gritty podcast. I'm your host, Brian call. And today I'm joined by Mark Livesey, and, uh, Mark is going to talk about the art of finding elk with your e-scouting co- courses. Part two, part two. Yeah, a few. We don't know how many yet. We're just saying part two. Yeah, yeah we're gonna do, we're gonna knock out a few at a time. And, and uh, basically, in this episode, we're gonna talk about uh, elk hunting realities and limitations in terms of e scouting, uh, and the value. And it. it's part of your modules uh, on your it's early in the course. It's one yep. of the early modules. And actually, and, and for those who don't know, it's basically Mark offers uh, through Treeline Academy uh, an an online e scouting course, very well done, professional course. That is uh, pretty much the highlight of the Western part of the highlight of the Western hunting summit. Lots of good information captured there. Well worth the money. But what we're doing on this podcast, we're just going to cover in a little bit of uh, a little tidbit here and there through each module. We're going to talk a little bit about it and uh, why it's important and and why you created it. And uh, hopefully for those that just kind of want a high level, which I don't recommend you just listen to this show, but but I do. I think that you'll get some information about e-scouting that'll get your mind turning, and uh, it'll be useful information. So, so, so with that said, Mark, um, we talked a little bit on this on the, about this on the last podcast. We're releasing one of these a week. So last week we covered this elk hunting realities and limitations. We got into them a little bit, probably a little longer than we probably should have in yeah. the first one. But 
you know, it's it's early in the course. I I didn't mention this in the first one, but I do want to mention this now is this is one of the modules that's available for free. So there are four modules in the course that you can take for free, um, and Realities and Limitations is one of them. Okay. So if you want to, you know, just check it out, kind of check a few modules See out. See what it feels like. See if it's even your up your alley. Mm-hmm. It doesn't get into much technical stuff. It just kind of gives you some theory. Um, so the way I kind of set the course up is I tried to do it in a progression that I thought was logical in the process of planning a hunt. And one of the very first things you're going to want to do beyond your research, I call it the, you know, we, we're probably not going to do a um, segment on this, but I, it's a, a good time to mention it is state, species, method, and application strategy. That module kind of takes you through how you can use the various tools that are available mm-hmm. um, and do your own research and kind of find places that meet the criteria that you, you know, has the numbers of elk you're looking for yeah the quality of the trophy you're kind of looking for what you're able to maybe more important these days what you're actually capable of getting Mm -hmm. um in terms of getting applying for the tag exactly we just talked about this a 10-year wait or a one-year wait exactly exactly so i kind of i don't go into details on how to get tags because there's a lot of great stuff about that right but i just i did do a pretty lengthy segment on doing your own research because i spend a lot of time researching areas yeah and um, so anyway, so that strategy article um, kind of accompanies this module. Okay. Because once you kind of figure out kind of where you want to hunt, what you want to hunt, meaning species, mm-hmm. what method of take, bow, rifle, whatever, your muzzle loader, then you got to start asking yourself, what are the realities of this hunt and what are my limitations? Or maybe even more importantly, what is your group's limitations if you're with a partner? <laughs> You right. know, when you're hunting with lampers like you do, yeah. there isn't a lot of limitations because <laughs> no. you two feed off each other and right. somebody's going to die before the hunt, yeah. before we quit a hunt. I'm not going to, I'm going to say I'm cold, <laughs> but I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you're not going to tell him you're cold. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go for my jacket before he goes for his jacket. <laughs> so, but you guys are, you guys are the strange example. I'm talking about groups where a lot of times I hear guys, I get, they're going with their dad mm-hmm. or yeah. they're taking their dad out. Okay. Our daughter. So Paley, exactly. Ryan was taking Paley and Hillary. You had to design that hunt a little bit. Now, oh. now they're kind of badasses. Let's be Ryan honest. was obsessed with his biggest concern was temperature. And it proved to be a major challenge. I mean, you, when you watch the movies, which are dropping soon, if they haven't dropped by the time this goes, um, yeah, the, it's a major concern for, uh, uh what? 11 year old. Yeah. And um and and Hillary, we wanted them to enjoy this enjoy trip, it, and, not and just we wanted it to be a struggle, not, but, but not, not a soul crusher. <laughs> yeah. So understanding the realities, um, you know, and that's such a high level thing, Brian. When they, when people say that, you're like, well, I I understand that. Well, let's talk about a few here. Yeah. Okay. So e scouting, obviously, it's not going to replace everything, but you're physical is obviously the one everybody talks about. You got to be in shape if you're going to elk hunt, okay? Right. 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 Everybody mm-hmm. knows that. To a, but you don't have to be in the greatest shape if you plan accordingly. Right. So physical is one everybody talks about, but one they is your time. Yeah. Last year, let me just tangent here. Ryan's like, let's go hunt this spot. I'm like, okay. And he's like, and I'm like, I'm looking at it on the map, and I'm like, okay, I think that's 30 miles of foot. <laughs> 30 foot miles of hiking. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, I didn't say anything. Oh yeah, sure. Okay. And then he's like, I think we could get there by that night. And then we could do, and I was like, I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. okay, stop 30 miles. I'm fine with 30 miles in one day. I'm not fine with my feet. Aren't I'm not, are you seeing me? I got short legs, stout body. I'm not, I'm not this long legged gazelle. Like I'm Ryan. I'm so worried about the 30 miles <laughs> in. I'm more worried about the 30 miles out with something that doesn't bother me. Because I know Ryan will keep up. We'll keep like if you let, stack us with weight, then I feel like I'll go as far as Ryan will go in the same day. Because I carry, I move heavy loads well. Yeah. Where it's different is a moderate load or a light load with his long legs and efficient frame, and I'm like this short fat kid like behind <laughs> him, like trying to keep up. I don't like it, but, but but the point was he was saying you know this distance didn't didn't really bother me, but to do it in that window, I'm like no. No. Well, so you face the reality. 
Yeah. But that reality is probably not in the playbook for most guys. <laughs> but your time, how much time do you have? Do you have seven days, 10 days, 20 days? Mm-hmm. You can get over your head on a hunt and not have time to really hunt it. Well, I'll tell you this. that for Like me, a 30 mile hunt? Yeah. Let's, you can't do it in seven days, hardly. No, 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 no. I mean, really, on an elk hunt, in my opinion. No. Because you got two days in, two days out. You, you're four days into your hunt. Yep. No, you're absolutely correct. And understanding your cutoff point. So, for example, I've done some remote hunts like that early 10 years ago where I was like, okay, I'm going to hike all the way into this spot. But I have, I have uh, 10 days of vacation time, you know, off of work. So I know that I, if I don't kill a buck, or I mean, if I didn't kill a deer, an elk by day seven, based on the logistics of getting it out and what I estimated I could pack per day and how far I would be in, I was easy, easy to do the math. It was like, okay, I have seven days to kill a bull in this area. And if I don't kill it in that seven days, even though I have four more days to hunt, the hunt in that spot's done because I don't have the time it takes to logistically pack that bull out over that period of days. And if I'm going to go in there, that means I know that that's the limitation I have. I can go now find another secondary backup place to hunt that's right next to a road, right. which is often what our strategy was. So you get remote, you go someplace crazy, nobody else goes, you have an epic adventure, but you know that if you don't kill by the end of X, Y, Z day, then you have to hike out and spend a couple of days on a roadside hunt somewhere because that's the only way you can fit the whole thing See, in. Think about what you just said. This is what I get on about. This is what I'm on Ryan all the time about. You don't realize how much knowledge is in your head when you've done, when you've been hunting for as many years as we have. Yeah. When I created this course, I thought, well, everybody knows this, knows this, knows this, but they don't. Right. A a lot of guys do, but a lot of guys don't. Like it would never occur to a lot of elk hunters Mm -hmm. that I'm going to plan my hunt. I'm going to go five miles in, but I know that I'm on a seven day hunt. So at at day five, I, I may need to move to this closer place between A and B. Mm-hmm. And get another area downloaded and planned and kind of researched, but that doesn't occur to them yeah, true, all the I time. Guess so, yeah. so what you just said is a perfect example of a hunt area mm-hmm. that you've made a modification to with a limitation of time. You're like, okay, I'm going to spend five days back here, and then I'm going to move to here and, st- and maximize my seven days. Right. But you, because I want that adventure. That's way you don't back want it to there. quit. You don't want to start driving home early. Yeah, but I also realize that if I don't kill by that day, then I can't realistically get that elk out of that that place. So moving to the other spot, though, I and I've killed bulls right next That's to right. the road on that secondary. But location. if you don't have that area downloaded, if you don't have waypoints, you don't have a strategy. You or, go home. You, you or might, you kill something on day, and you're like, what, do, what the hell? Like you're. Yeah. You're stuck back there. You're calling your boss. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to be two days late back to work, which ain't nothing wrong with that. But but so anyway, you know, time commitments, you really got to analyze it. I talk Mm -hmm. a lot about the number of days, how you break it up. And, you know, because this kind of links to that hunt area. So the other thing is, we talked about this off air. You can't kill elk that aren't there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Guys invest everything. In a hunt, I'm going to this spot. They have no other plans. They, that's their spot. They're packing in a huge camp. They're setting up, or even worse, they got this big base camp set up by their trucks, and it's too elaborate. And they don't want to take it down. And they just suffer through seven days of no elk. Right. How many stories you hear like that? Yeah. But if you have plans around that, you understand the realities of that, and you know there's a chance. Even with the best e scouting guys, I mean, I think I'm pretty good at finding out now. It's questionable about killing big elk, but Mm -hmm. finding them doesn't seem to be the problem for me, but killing big ones seems to be my problem. (laughs) I kill lots of elk, but not (laughs) big ones. Lampers just totally (laughs) pisses me off constantly. Right, right. But finding them is never not usually the problem, Um, but you can't kill them if they're not there. And even with the best East County, you're going to have goose egg areas. Yeah. That's why I recommend three to five. Mm -hmm. So... Boots on the ground. We talked a lot about that. Most guys that are taking the course, one of the reasons you do so much e-scouting, I would make the argument that the more I've learned about e-scouting, the less boots on the ground I spend. I'm a believer that with elk, as far as elk now, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to disagree with me. I feel I'm better finding elk on my computer than I am 
scouting in the summer where the elk are not going to be where they're at. Correct. Yeah. Now you can always look for old rut sign. You can do some things. There is some things you can do with boots on the ground, but just because that hillside's full of elk in the summer does not mean they're going to be there September. Yeah. I mean, for sure. Correct. So right. I feel like I am better now doing it remotely than I am boots on the ground and boots on the ground. Unless you are crazy fit, crazy committed and have tons of time. You cannot do areas justice. You can't mm. ease guy. I'm sorry. You can't boots on the ground cover the area that you need to cover in a lot of cases mm-hmm. to really, really evaluate an area. You know, it, to, yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? It does. So you can you can only get a slice of that area, or you can get a kind of get a picture of that area. So I I'm a big believer. So the boots on the ground is limiting. I think the elk are on the move a lot during the seasons. They change so much compared to other things. Um, and the other thing is like statistical realities. So if you're hunting public land over the counter, you know, little more limited success areas, which a lot of us have to do until you draw some of these tags. Yeah. You got to be ready to move. Mm-hmm. You got to be ready to go where the elk are. And I think that's a, that's, that's a reality that a lot of guys just don't think enough about. Yeah. I think that's a reality for, all of the hunts, bear, mule deer, elk. People often ask, you know, you know, how do we, how are Ryan and I getting on these big animals and killing these animals on every hunt? It seems like we go out on these public land places and then we find these animals. I would venture to, to, I'd wager that we probably, I don't know how many miles we cover compared to the other hunters that are comparing us together. Um, but I think it's vast. I think it's that vast. It's, it's vast. And what, what you end up with is, you know, we're covering area that most people won't cover. We were in an area last year hunting bears in the springtime and, and, uh, we were in this, con- this little spot. Well, I think we went from the, t- from the spot that Ryan shot his first bear to the, where he shot his, his second bear. I think that was a 25 mile distance between the two and we did it all on foot we that's how much ground we covered between hunting along the way hunting along the way just right hiking no, no 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 just, we, just that's where we ended up when we finally yeah. found another bear um and uh and with bears it's different because it seems like and elk i think though are similar in the sense that they're not uh they're either there or they're not well i talk about this you know i'm a big white tail guy i'm from missouri yeah here's the facts there's a lot of Midwestern areas that have 20 whitetails a square mile. Mm-hmm. You're lucky on elk if you can get one or two elk per square mile. Think about that for a minute. Yeah. So you're talking about out west, 30 million acres, public land acres in Montana and Colorado. They're about the same, 30 yeah. million-ish. Mm-hmm. That means there is far more area without elk than right. there is without. Right. So <laughs> Ryan, he always hates when I say this in the summit because <laughs> Ryan is a – you keep talking about this too. 25 miles here, 35 miles there. And I always say, you need to learn how to be a hunt a little smarter than hunt harder. And he's <laughs> right. like, no, you don't. You just go out there and just keep hiking until you find a giant bull. And I'm like, well, that, that does no, work for some no, it's people. it's true though. <laughs> like with Ryan, when we haven't tagged out and he we're approaching the end cut. of the hunt, we cover miles that would I'm like, Ryan, just because we're hiking further, that's not necessarily the answer. <laughs> yeah. Yet. It works out. It works. Often it does. We You're do increasing. So it. that's an odd multiplier, okay? But that's yeah. only one. No, I can recall uh, years ago uh, um, hanging out with some friends who would elk hunt from the road. And then we would backpack in and elk hunt on a backpack. And they were showing us they were killing giant bulls constantly. And this is in, in Oregon, right? And we're like, how do they do it? Well, they would get in their car in the morning and they drive a hundred yards, bugle call, drive hundred yards, bugle call, drive hundred yards, bugle call, drive hundred. And they would just drive these roads and bugle call, bugle call, bugle call. And then when they got a bull that answered back, they'd dive off the road and go chase this bull and call it in and kill it. And they were showing us the country they covered with that drive and call technique versus us in the little tiny pocket that we accomplished on foot, the vast area they were just playing that game of, of, of odds of quantity covered. It's right. And so you, I think it is when you're e-scouting and you're planning these kind of trips, 
um, the, the, the advantage to being on foot and, or with llamas or something in some back country is there's nobody else out there with you. And when you do find an animal, you can play, slow play that animal right. however you want. Until and they you kill might be it. a little more responsive in some totally. cases. Totally. Yeah. Less skittish, less alert, less. The guys that do the way you're, they're going to get more at bats. Yes. Um, but it's going to take a little longer to hit a home run. Right. But when you pack into a spot, you got a finite, you are, unless you're you guys, you are, maybe you're in isolating yourself to one big bowl. And sometimes that's it. That's what happens is it's like, well, it's, it's nine miles to that one and bowl. This, we're putting all of our eggs in our basket. Yeah. Here. And we go there for two days and we're like, didn't work. Yep. Cause there's either going to be a bear in that salad bowl or not. Mm-hmm. And it's like, we're not going to sit there and wait for some bear to come over the mountain and then yeah. roll into the bowl. Uh, we found that that we could wait a long time for that. So it's like, well, nine miles back out. And then we go to the next nine mile bowl <laughs> and we just, we just, that's what happens. So I think having, but see, we have all these routes and they're coordinated too. Part of that thing with the 25 miles, we had gone like, okay, well, it's, it's from the central location, this direction, it's like 12 miles. Okay. We're going to get there and we're, we're there. We hunt a few days and then we're like, okay, the next spot is three miles over here. Okay. And then the next spot is two miles that way. But then we, it's this big circle to get us back and it's 25 miles. Yes. From the last distance as a crow flies from that one to that spot. However, we didn't do it all in one day. We did it with our e scouting well, here and go back. Yeah. Or you might be halfway and then you'll have to decide what's the best way. But so, all of that's tied in with our with our whole plan. We we went to every area on that particular hunt that we had pre planned to go to. There wasn't an area that we were like, where should we go to next? Yeah. Like in fact, you I have to left talk stuff on the table. I have to talk Ryan out of going to places. <laughs> Just to go there. Yeah. Because he's like, well, I've seen it in an e-scouting map. You probably have this obsession too. Now you want to see it with your own eyes. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that's great, but that's 18 miles that we don't have to do. There's a bear over here. Yeah. Well, I call that in the course progressive hunting. Okay. Where you're going from point A to point B, and I, I highly endorse that method because yeah. you're always seeing new country. Yeah. You've got to plan, but it's got to be planned. You're not just rolling out there and every morning waking up. Yeah, we should roll 15 miles that way because, no. one, you've already downloaded your data, right? Mm-hmm. You've got your kind of worked out. You may not have, you know, every day where you're going to be every day. And some guys, you know, when you, like we talked about in the hunt plan, we'll just back up here. You can make it as detailed as you, your personality. Yeah. Kind of. I like mine detailed. I may never pull the thing out. It's kind of like studying for a test. Mm-hmm. If you write things down yeah. and take good notes, you hardly even have to study. Right. I feel like when you do a hunt plan and you write it out yeah. and you really meticulously study it, you may never even pull the paper out because well, you're reducing it to, I call it in the course, historical knowledge. Yeah. You've kind of reduced that in your head yep. so that you kind of know what you're going to be doing. Yeah, yeah. When I f- produce a film, you know, I might have uh, six hours of video and I'm going to condense it down to 20 minutes. So- 25 or whatever it is i'll take that content and i'll take my notes and i'll map it i'll go this concept this idea this piece that piece that that shot this and i kind of watch it and i just kind of jot down my notes and then i ch- i don't even use the notes That's right you've already know what you're They're, doing because the act of creating the notes solidifies That's the same thing with this home plan. plans is doing it you know it, it, it's a great way to do it yeah and i don't think a lot of guys are doing it they're kind of like throwing waypoints on their on their hunt platforms yeah. and, and they get out there and they're like, just start looking at their screen. Well, when you were talking about limitations, you know, like with Hillary and Paley and yeah. designing the hunt around that, um, you know, I feel like that, especially if you have youth or, or you're hunting with your spouse or somebody who is new to hunting that doesn't have the passion for it. So for example, at this age and at this point in my life, I'm willing to pay the cost, whatever that is, to try to get that buck that I'm after or that, that really special elk, you know? And so someone who's newer to this isn't willing to pay the price of going hungry for three days and hiking those miles. Well, I don't know that they're not willing to do it as much as they may not even know what is the price. Yeah. You have to understand two things. One, what you're willing to pay. Yeah. But maybe even more importantly is what, what are you going to be asked to pay? Yeah, yeah. It's very so, true. So I think that a lot of the questions, these are obvious things. And this, a lot of this stuff in this module, it's more of a reminding you of what you need to be thinking about mm-hmm. 
in order before you embark on this journey is just doing some soul searching Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and kind of getting your thoughts together. And, you know, all the things you've been talking about, Brian, are so ingrained in your head. You already kind of know it. Yeah. You just, you think that that's just the way everybody should think. Yeah. Well, not everybody's wired like that yet. Right. They don't have the experience yet. They they haven't been in the back country enough nights or enough days, or they haven't tested their ability to go without food. Even mm-hmm. some guys would be like, we're not food. Well, we got to head to the truck. Yeah. They're one. Oh, I've been on hunts. We're two out days of food. earlier because they're afraid they're going to run out of food. Well, I, I was on a, I'm not going to name names. <laughs> I was on a hunt this year. We started running out of food. I mean, we're ready to head. There's one guy that's got to eat. Yeah. On this hunt. The guy's got to eat. (laughs) Yeah. He goes, well, it's over. I'm I'm (laughs) heading to the truck. We're nine miles back. Right. And we weren't seeing a ton of elk anyway. So it was, everybody's kind of on board, but we were really going back because we were running low, low. We weren't even out yet. (laughs) Well, I think as some people in this last episode we produced, people left comments. They're like, it's crazy that you guys were out of food and you're hiking back that day. But you didn't hesitate. If you saw another deer, no one was saying, should we go for it? Should we not go for it? It wasn't even a question. Do we just go hungry for a couple more days to, to, if you're on the, if you're on the chase and the hunt, a hundred percent, like nobody in that group questions it, but we also know what those limitations are. You've done a little bit of test. You didn't go the first time you went hungry on a hunt probably wasn't four days. might've been a day or two. Right. So what, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's like when I raced triathlon, my first bike ride wasn't a hundred miles. Yeah. It, it, you kind of learn what your capabilities are. You certainly don't want to learn them on your first hunt and your first elk hunt right. to find out if you can go. Right. Well, I'll well, see if I can go five days. Well, <laughs> and you have to ask yourself like what you're in it for. Let's be honest. Like a lot of guys, and I don't blame them for this. They want to go out and enjoy themselves. There's nothing wrong with that. And I'm, I'm the, the, the why idea. Do you think of, I got llamas. Yeah. The <laughs> idea of doing what Ryan and I sometimes do just is like, why I want to, oh, it's fine. I'll watch you do it. But I'm, that doesn't interest me. And I don't blame them. There's things like shopping at the mall. It doesn't interest me. I think I get nothing out of it. I don't, I don't want to go there and I don't want to shop. So I totally get that. And, and so I think understanding your limitations has to do with also understanding your values and, and, and then set, building the hunt you want around your values and your limitations, not just yours. But the your people groups. in your group. Well, and that's mostly well, like Lambert, what it is now. He, until you came along, the dude hardly hunted, except with his his cousins and, mm-hmm. you know, it, very limited. Yep. I mean, the dude's like a total selfie trophy taker. Yeah, he's a solo. He, he, he prefers being alone. He does not do well with people. I can recall, like, going out and, well, even for me, I wanted to have these adventures but there's very few people who can take that many days off yeah. or who are even willing to or want to that can then that want to stay out there and seek out the oldest animal they can find and if that means you got to extend your hunt you know an extra seven days to kill something that's 10 inches bigger like that's where that's where i you know i don't know why that's what interests me and, it, it, and <laughs> that list of people who will do what i want to do is short. I have I, everyone quits on me. Well, and then I find Ryan, and it's like, you know, and I've had people in the past hunting partners that never that wouldn't quit either. A few, but they had different goals, yeah, different values. They're tough too. Lots but of guys already, that hunt. You've with already that gone through this process we're talking about here. You know the realities. Yeah, you know the limitations. You're you and Ryan's. This is you know we talk about Ryan a lot mainly because this yeah your video series is kind of out right yeah. now. So freaking popular thing but the reality is they aligned your realities and your limitations and his limitations are pretty equivalent yeah and that's a nice scenario but when i took my daughter hunting last year you got to change it and your wife is starting mm-hmm. to kind of get into it now more i'm, I'm much more concerned about that i will tell you this though <laughs> i'm meaner and tougher on my wife and my daughter than ryan is on his Well, my son's 11 now <laughs> so my game world is changing too a little bit me now. and james were like looking at hillary and paley and we're like ryan's being too nice you can be tougher on those two and they're tough girls oh yeah and yet he's still pretty he's pretty he's he a softy yeah, man he is a he's softy. a softy he's a, he's a softy he's not with me he ain't not with james <laughs> he's not he's a, he's a hitler but with those two he is a softy well, anyway, I think that you'll get a lot out of spending time yeah, kind of doing some soul searching before you start doing soul searching when you're on the side of the mountain. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and not just, I think one of the biggest takeaways is don't get just fixated on yourself. Yeah. Start studying who you're with and there's, there's no sense killing your hunting partner the first day and then ruining yeah. six days of hunting. Well, and I've been some places where I've hiked into so some daunting areas and thought no, not much of it because I'm used to it. And I brought somebody in who's maybe spent more time in the city or less time outdoors and they get out there and they are just feeling so isolated and alone yep. that it's a shocker. It'd be like taking Joe Rogan out to some of these places. <laughs> it's one thing if you're hunting out of Deseret, you know, <laughs> and you come back each night and you have steak yeah. and potatoes in a, in a cabin. It's another thing when you drag them off into, you know, the, the wilderness area where you're dry, where you're, you're there alone and there's no one that can come in and save you and there's wolves howling and <laughs> it's a different thing. Right. And, and I think anytime you're going to go and do that kind of thing with someone, I, I feel it's, it was a bit daunting in New Zealand on some of these cliffs faces, you know, and going. Yeah, you were saying you were a little, un, I'm not a heights uh, guy. I did not like it. Ryan didn't like, right. neither one of us liked yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But you kind of learned and adapted. I never want and, to be in that position ever again. Um, we, we, that's how people die. I'm and, not a heights guy. Me and heights do not get along like yeah, that. Yeah. I do have a sick fascination with heights i don't i do like risking heights but um within reason and i felt like that was <laughs> snow of, it changes everything yo man it, it, it's one thing to be snow is unpredictable ice and snow in a di- in a different way than any other footing is and uh so it was it was our limitations were exceeded on that hunt we didn't know that's another case of not having enough research and knowledge and experience. We didn't know what the cost would be for, yeah. for where we shot some of these critters or we had to go to get some of these tall. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, it was the scariest hunt I've ever been on. Really? By far, by far. Uh, and I, th- I think Ryan would probably say the same thing. New Zealand is, n- is no joke. Look at those Southern Alps. No joke that, that country is, that country and that those weather conditions and stuff, they are, you want an adventure, you go there. That's a whole nother level of daunting, can be. It can be whatever you want it to be. Um, ex- a quick side note, you know, we were, we had, Ryan had shot this tar and it was a beautiful bull and it had fallen the wrong way. You know, it's teetering on an edge, right? And, he, and, and we should have been more patient, right? But we, 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 we've been there days and we hadn't shot one and, and I had just dropped one and it fell right where we wanted it to easy to get to. Well, he shoots it and it, it just falls the other way, disappears. And, uh, the next day we look all that night and even into the dark, which was foolish and, and scary. And we get ourselves off that mountain and the whole night I, I couldn't sleep because I was afraid of, the fact that I felt like I had to go back up there the next day and get this tar. And we both had this attitude. Like there were a lot of people who logged entries in this book that said shot three tar recovered one, you know, in in these huts systems, there's all over shot two tar recovered one shot three shot four recovered two. And, uh, and we just kind of were like, man, don't shoot it if you're not going to recover it, you know? So here we find ourselves in this situation and I couldn't sleep next morning. You know, lots of, lots of anxiety, but I climbed up there, got up there and we got up there and we're looking for this tar and it's, you know, one slip and you fall a thousand feet to your death and it's melty snow and ice and we're kicking out like footing. And, uh, you know, this is ground that I normally wouldn't even hesitate to skip across, but there was no thousand foot penalty on yeah. when you're walking just in snow <laughs> on a slope, you know? So I, we were sitting there doing this and um, we're at this peak, the high, one of the highest peaks. Well, a couple of miles away, these guys from Norway that are ice climbers and mountaineers, they're, they're glassing from the hut and Luke Dusenberry, who came with us to film, he had hurt his knee a couple of days earlier. So Ryan and I had left the cameraman behind and it was all me filming by myself um, the hunt and, he's there in the cabin with the Norway guys and the Norway guys are like, Hey, we found your buddies. And, and he, and Luke is like, where are they? Where are they? And they're like, look through this spotting scope and <laughs> they look and we're at the top of this icy peak. And he, and the Norway guys go, Oh, the, and the, are those them? He's like, Oh yeah, that's them. That's them. And he goes, they look very, very scared. <laughs> 
with his accent. They are very, very scared. And literally, we were like, like moving one step at a time. We were scared, and I was just like shaking and trying to in from from a couple miles away through a spotter. <laughs> they could tell we were scared. We we're crapping our pants up there. Um, but I think we'll never put ourselves in that situation again. We'll have, you know, we, we know those limitations now. We'll be more careful. But uh, back to what I was saying earlier, I think that people can get themselves into some trouble. And well, it's it's trouble. And Brian. even if it's not trouble, I was going to say it's, it's unenjoyable. It's unenjoyable, but it's also it causes the quitting. Yes, it's right. You're going to cut quit. You're going to quit early. Yeah, I have guys. I, one of my highest downloaded podcasts this year has been quitting and going home. Oh, really? I had no idea. I just had somebody write me a note that said, I quit. I quit. I had four or five days left to hunt. I I spent all year preparing for this elk hunt. I got up there. I hunted six days and I quit. And I still had days left. And I'm disappointed now that I'm home and I'm on my couch that I quit. And maybe something would have happened had I stayed. And they're like, I don't know why I quit. And then... And I, and I got, I get a few notes like that. So I responded to him on that podcast and could not believe the engagement, the feedback, the number of people who watched it, who are also trying to find the same answers. How do I not quit when it got hard? Having backup plan is a big part of it. Feeling confident that you've got a strategy that if this one doesn't work out, we're going to immediately row to plan B, C, D and E, but whatever think, it is. I think the plan and the, and the limitations. And I know? always, so here, it, so because I, part of my podcast was know that you're going to quit if you get cold and wet, therefore bring fire. Yeah. Know that you're going to quit if, if you don't have, if you're alone and you don't have like a book to read yeah. or, or a video to watch or something at night, at least once or twice to just take your mind off of where yeah. you're at. Like know that you're going to quit if, if you can't re- contact your family and you're going to have all this anxiety because your family, you don't know if they're doing okay or not. Okay. Cause right. you thought you could go into blackout for seven days, but now three days in, you're like, I'm, I'm, it's I want to go man. home. I have this bad feeling yeah. about my kids or yeah. something. All that stuff plays a role. So you, knowing yourself and those limitations and then planning for that, I think is, well, we didn't really mention this important. hunt area. So I'm, I mentioned I had, have this backup hunt area for elevation. Mm-hmm. The other one I recommend you always have is a base camp option. No matter what kind of hunter you are, let's say you're a back, you're, you, it's Ryan, you and Ryan. I would recommend you guys, now you guys probably wouldn't follow my advice, but <laughs> you'd want to have a base, meaning a vehicle camp option planned out because we always do. What happened if your knee, if you hurt yourself? Like we, you talked about the guy. We always have his knee. We have a major base camp, which we don't film or talk about much. Because you may not have to use it. And, um, mm-hmm. but I always recommend that in your hunt areas, you know, the five you have. You have one at a different elevation, and you have one, at least one, that is a short, you know, whatever, if you want to call it a car camp, whatever people like to call it. Right. Because you can get injured, and you want to go home. Maybe you're not injured to the point you can't hunt. You just can't hunt seven miles back. Right. Or maybe you can't do the steepness anymore, the fatigue factor. So having that backup that's ready to implement, that's the key operative word here, Mm -hmm. not just in your head. But ready to go. You're going to be far less likely to pull the plug and quit. Yeah. If you know you've got something ready to go. Right. That's right. viable. And you've researched it and you looked into it. Yeah. It's not just a, well, we'll just run over here and hunt off the road. Yeah. I don't know that you're going to be excited about that. Yeah. But if you've already looked at it, you've already got it worked out. You already got some spots yeah. that you want to check out. Yep. You're I agree. Be, you're going to be more likely to go there. Yeah. Yeah. Versus yeah. go home. Yeah, for sure. All right. Great. Well, folks, I think we're going to wrap this one up. Uh, The next one is evaluating zones of pressure. And I think that's one of my favorites. That's probably the number one question I get. Evaluating zones of pressure. um, Because 90% of our strategy for Ryan and myself to find big animals on public land is to go where no one else goes. And that's it. And that... The worst thing is to to bust your ass to get into a spot only to find there's six guys back there because you misread you, missed you misread the access points in those zones of pressure. Big part of the course. So, all right, folks, thanks for tuning in. Check out Mark's class, Tree Line Academy uh, dot net, and uh, use the code Gritty if you're interested in getting the course. And uh, thanks for tuning in. If you got any questions for us, leave it in the comment section on the YouTube videos. We appreciate you. Stay gritty. <laughs>